Well, to uh, <laughs> to quote uh, from a Laurel and Hardy movie, another fine mess you've gotten us into, Stan. The notice this waveform has a very uh, truncated pulse here. It also has some some issues with with this. In other words, this waveform and this waveform look pretty much the same, but this one is quite different. So how do you find that kind of thing? Well, as we'll find out in a, in a little bit, we're going to go through a few more of the triggers of this uh, Regal MSO 5000, and we're particularly going to uh, try to find that pulse. So far on our list of pulses, or trigger types I should say, we've looked at edge, pulse, slope, and video. Today I'd like to look at pattern, duration, timeout, and runt. Now, the uh, what, what you'll discover is that the pattern and duration are very similar to one another and they both use uh, multiple channels. Uh, it can be as up to uh, 20 channels, but as few as two channels. The timeout trigger we'll see is actually very much like the pulse trigger, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then we'll we'll finish by looking at the runt trigger. So uh, let's take a look at uh, at uh, triggers in general. And for those of you that uh, are interested in uh, in history, I went to Wikipedia. Uh, thought it might be a good idea to see if what Wikipedia had to say about uh, triggers. And so. I went to, to Wikipedia and searched for the first trigger and what they, what they came up with was this. Uh, I was a little puzzled. I couldn't see the connection between this and an oscilloscope, but I, I realized later that I, I could hear a song and I'm I not sure if I got the, uh, the words right, but it sounded like what they were doing was singing Happy Trace to you until we meet again. So that's probably why this is related to the first trigger. Uh, those of you that may know more about this could, uh, could comment, I suspect. But let's take a look now at the duration trigger. Now the, the duration trigger uses multiple channels. And what it is looking for is for a pattern. Now, in this respect, it's, it's identical to the duration trigger. In fact, you can use duration or pattern to find a pattern. The difference between the duration trigger and the pattern trigger is, with the duration trigger, the pattern has to exist for a specified amount of time. So, suppose you're looking for this pattern. It's high, 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 high. And you want, you're not interested in times when there is just a small overlap. You want to make sure that, for example, that pattern lasts for, let's say, 100 nanoseconds. So you set the duration to 100 nanoseconds and you set the pattern to high, 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 high. Now, this, these Channels can be the analog channels, they can be the digital channels, or they can be all of the channels. In other words, all 20 channels. And for those channels that you don't want uh, the pattern to interact, you can put a don't care. So you can turn on all the channels and then, and then uh, essentially ignore all those you don't want to look at by, by setting them to don't care. So you set a pattern, you set a duration, and it will trigger on that. We'll, we'll look at that later when we start uh, doing actual embedded debugging. But that is the duration trigger, and in essence it's the same as the uh, pattern trigger, which, like I say, we'll look at uh, in a future video. 
if you're looking for the duration of a uh, signal on a single channel, not a pattern, you can use the timeout trigger. What the timeout trigger does is it, it senses, this is the trigger level, it senses when the waveform goes through the trigger in one direction and when it comes back through the trigger in the other direction and it compares that to a time you have set. So if you, for example, have set a timeout of this amount, you're saying if the, if the trigger rises uh, or the waveform rises through the trigger and comes back through the trigger before this timeout, don't trigger on it. But if it takes longer than that, then show me that pulse. In other words, you're looking for, suppose this is a clock and you're looking for a situation where the clock goes high and is supposed to come back low, say at this point, at this midpoint, but it doesn't. And now and then it stays high for essentially two half cycles and you want to look for that. Well, you set the timeout to something more than one half cycle and and then, if there is a clock that is longer than, than the ones than the normal clock, it will trigger on it. We'll look at timeout triggers again at some point in the future when we're doing a little more debugging. But those that have been paying attention to are the triggers we've looked at already might say, hey, wait a minute, that looks a lot like the pulse trigger that we looked at earlier. Isn't it the same thing? And the answer is yes, essentially it is. And I introduce this because please understand that sometimes you uh, will find that there's more than one way to skin the cat. And in this case, if you were looking at a clock pulse and, and you wanted to know if there were any clock pulses that were longer than or, le or shorter than the, the specification, you could either use the pulse trigger or you could use the timeout trigger. So now let's look at the rump trigger. Whenever a pulse that's supposed to go all the way to uh, a high level and then return instead only goes part of the way, we call that a runt pulse. And these happen often in systems, especially when you're debugging them, because uh, this can happen because of signal contention. In other words, two signals that are never supposed to overlap, overlap so that one signal is trying to hold this line low and the other signal is trying to drive it high. And as a result, you get the sum of the two, which is, uh, which is uh, something in between. So a runt trigger is intended to, to allow you to trigger on that and once again it can be a negative runt or a positive runt and that is the signal that we were looking at earlier. So let's look at how we set up a runt trigger. So we're triggering on this and you notice that every now and then there are some some anomalies going on. By the way, this is one of the indicators that we'll talk about later when we talk about how do you know there's something that there might be something wrong with your signal and how do you use an oscilloscope to help you track that down. But for now, let's just assume that we already suspect that there is a runt pulse in this uh, in this waveform or this uh, pattern. And let me pardon the you see, we're using the edge trigger, and you'll notice that it's a little hard to figure out what's going on here. The, the edge trigger is sort of working, but it's clearly missing. It's not really synchronized to what's going on. So let's turn on the rump trigger. And we do that by going to the trigger menu and changing the type from edge to runt. Now, it doesn't seem to have made things any better. But let's now adjust 
the, the, the trigger levels. Let's set level B, which is the, the baseline level, down to this area. Notice that a runt shows up. We were lucky because the runt turns out to be just below the midpoint. When you first enable the runt trigger, it sets both the level A and level B to the midpoint of the waveform. But let's adjust level A a little bit so you can see that. And there is level A, the top level. Now let's suppose that that runt had been a little taller than that. If you notice that when level A drops below the upper level of the runt, it loses the, the trigger. As long as level A is above and level B is below the maximum height of the runt pulse, it will trigger on that runt pulse. And that is the way you use the runt trigger. Now what you can do is use this and turn on additional channels to see what's going on. For example, go look at your clock enable signal. There's two possibilities anytime you have this kind of runt pulse. One is that the thing generating the pulse is not generating a correct pulse. And the other possibility is that you're generating the correct pulse, but something else is interfering with it downstream. And of course, that's one of the things we will talk about in future episodes. So, uh, as I say, I've uh, uh, been doing research into this area. Uh, uh, I've always been the, the, one of the guys that stayed after work. When, whenever a new piece of equipment came in, I would uh, I would stay after work that day if I if nobody else did, and grab the manual and sit there and play with it and try to figure out how to use it. As a result, over a period of time, people were, were having trouble finding a problem in their in their circuit would often come to me uh, to ask is there anything uh, that you can suggest here's what I think is going on what what do you uh, think we might be able to use to do this and sometimes because I was a lab rat I was able to point them to a particular feature of a particular piece of equipment that helped them out and that's what I'm really trying to do in this video series, is uh, try to pass on some of the things I learned from mountains of Tektronix manuals and Hewlett-Packard manuals over the years, and more recently Regal and Siglent manuals and others. So I hope that this is the kind of material you're looking for. I'm both looking at the MSO 5000, but I'm also looking at generalized use of an oscilloscope in embedded systems. So please stay tuned. As always, stay safe and have a nice day.